go. There we go. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? I can. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, doing well. Long time no see. Yeah, I know. It's been a while. I feel like, what was it, ESA in Oregon? Was that the last time? Oh, my God. Probably, yeah. Yeah, so how are things, how are things with you? Well, fine. I'm obviously a bit quiet, you know, getting a bit stir-crazy at home, but yeah. it feels a bit odd. It's hard to concentrate. I don't know, it's something about the situation of being in lockdown of some sort, so sort of slightly disturbing. You sort of think you're in a little bubble, so... Um, but it's okay. I mean, you know, it's hard on the grad students, so because you know those that need to do practical work, the university's closed. So you did your uh, your bachelor's of science uh, honors in zoology, the University of Sheffield in Yorkshire, right. South Yorkshire, Absolutely. which looks like kind of like a, a charming little place. It's an old industrial steel city, so it's Whoa. kind of an interesting combination of sort of very working class and then the university is stuck on one side of it. There's some very beautiful countryside called the Peak District. So it was an interesting place to be really. I did my, I did my honors project on bird behavior. So I saw oh, myself interesting. going out there and studying behavior and behavioral ecology was my thing. But then you tend to, in the UK it's a very different system. So you apply for a project, not yep. necessarily for a sort of a professor. Um, so you might look for projects with a professor you like, but usually individual people get grants for certain topics or certain projects. So they advertise and their students apply. So I just applied for this topic because it appealed to me and that was it really. I thought, you know, I think there are worse places to go than Oxford. So and, and and so, and sorry, so the uh, bird behavior was your PhD or was that your, your undergrad honors? That was my undergrad honors was on, on bird behavior. So it was on aloe preening or something. So I, you, know, you know what it's like, you do a project, you really like it, you think you want to carry on. Um, yeah. but in, you know, in reality, that didn't work out. And in some ways, I'm quite happy with that. Um, but I felt my career has been serendipitous. It's kind of been following interesting things that interested me rather than planning everywhere I would go for 20 years. Well, I'm, I might be mistaken, but I think a lot of us entomologists uh, are in a similar kind of category. Because, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I thought I was going to be a police officer. As, as soon as I started getting old enough, I started thinking I'm going to be a veterinarian or a doctor. And then it wasn't until I was really exposed to the field of entomology and had opportunities in the field that I just kept kind of pursuing it. And it I mean, it's serendipitous, just like you mentioned. And you get interested. I went through the I want to be a doctor phase. I'm really very relieved I'm not because I think I've all <laughs> gone into research because that's always what interested me. So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yes, that's it. So I think I got into entomology. In fact, I, mean, I shouldn't say this, but I remember saying to my head of department before I left my undergraduate university that I'd do anything but entomology. Wow. <laughs> um, mainly because they focus on physiology there. They were very into insect physiology, mammalian physiology. And I thought I didn't really want to pull heads off cockroaches and things. So, but then you find, you, know, you get a project, you get interested, and you realize how many other more interesting things you can do with entomology. And it's a right. topic if you want to actually answer real questions with yeah. you know, numbers of specimens. And that's, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because when I was applying to do my master's, so I did, you know, I obviously did my master's uh, under your supervision. Um, I was, I actually had two choices between you and it was another lab that was a lot more kind of insect physiology. And for me, it just wasn't, it just didn't quite inspire me. I know a lot of people that love that field and are in it, but uh, when I, you know, interviewed with you and, and knew a little bit more about kind of the research that you were doing, that's what kind of pulled me in and uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting how varied kind of the field is, I guess, in many ways. You can do anything. For me, it was I, when I did my first course in ecology as an undergraduate. So I thought, oh, wow, this is really cool. And I think you either think like an ecologist or you don't, really. It's either something that really you think, wow, there's some really cool questions, but they're really challenging. Or you think, oh, my goodness, that's so difficult. I don't know how to do it or it's not mechanistic enough. But for me, it was like, wow, there's so many cool things. I loved watching animals. And you feel you could really build, build on that sort of thing. Uh, so you did your PhD then at University of Oxford, which upon researching it a little bit more, I didn't realize is one of the earliest, one of the first academic institutions to exist in the English language. It is, yes, you forget that. But when you cycle around it and you look at the buildings that are 500 plus years old, it's a special <laughs> place to be. To be honest, I, even I got a bit of a kick. It's like cycling around in the evening, listening to the bells and going, going past places like the Radcliffe camera. You think, wow, it could have been here 500 years ago and it would have been... <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of neat. Yeah. And then what was your what was your research then? 
I was looking at um, generalist predators in wheat crops. So it's one of the things that was trendy at the time was looking at how generalist predators particularly were influenced by hedgerows, um, whether they had any role in pest suppression. So I, the university oh, has no. a farm out of a place called Whiteham. So I did my project looking at carabid, or carabid beetles and staphylinid beetles, looking at their capacity for eating anything really. So yeah. I did a series of a lot of pit, lot of pitfall trapping, more than I ever want to do again, <laughs> um, and then a whole load of functional response work in the lab, basically. So looking at patterns in the field over the year, um, doing mark recapture stuff, and then say looking at how their capacity to eat prey in the lab and you know, whether there was a sort of size gradation. So what was the kind of the drive towards generalist predators then? Because from what I've read in the literature, um, you know, based on my work, is that Generalists uh, are thought that uh, they are maybe not ideal for pest suppression because they can engage in, you know, eating other predators in a similar guild, intraguild predation, or, you know, eating other beneficial insects, whereas specialists will kind of specialize on the, on the particular prey. So was there a paradigm shift around when you were doing your PhD? Pretty much just before then, people started getting interested in whether they were kind of there to mop up everything. I mean, obviously, yes, they do eat each other. And that was a problem with pitfall trapping, if you wanted live stuff, but they were going to be there and the high densities and they were very voracious. And some of them climbed up plants so they could get aphids. So there was this general feeling that if they were there in high enough quantities, they would still have a suppressive effect, even if they haven't got maybe sort of the fine tuning that a specialist might have for its prey. Okay. And also there was interest in how farming practices would alter them as well, of course. So things like taking out the hedgerows, whether they were beneficial. So that was the area where beetle banks came in and all that sort of thing was developed in the UK about the same time was, do we have to put in special uh, areas for generalists and other things like parasitoids to overwinter in? Okay. And are, so, I mean, here in the U S I mean, I don't know that that's very common practice to use, uh, you know, like uh, conservation biological control. Is that something that's commonly used there or is it still very academic? No, it's commonly used in Europe. Um, wow. Probably. So things like putting in non-spraying headlands in fields and stuff like that. Um, particularly, well, in, <laughs> before Brexit, sponsored by the EU, there was certainly money to actually put in things like beetle banks, preserve hedgerows put in field boundaries that were unsprayed, put in flower banks and stuff like that. So it's much, much more of a European thing is to try and the conservation biocontrol really started. And I think it's still, it's still present in Europe. And then, so after your PhD, you went on to become a section leader at the Natural Environment Research Council Center for Ecology and Hydrology. So what is a section leader? I mean, because I understand it's a bit different there than it is any model we have here? Well, firstly, okay, it's a government job. So I went straight, I mean, I didn't start as a section leader. I went basically into a, a group um, and they were one of the first groups to develop microbial pesticides, particularly viruses for control. Oh. A lot of this started in Canada, in fact, in Sault Ste. Marie, in the, um, the Forest Institute there, known as the Bug Lab. Really? So that's one of the first places. That's partly why I went there later. But Interesting. So, People in Oxford were very keen on this. Um, so the whole institute really started off in the basement of the forestry department. And it used to be called the unit of invertebrate pathology. Um, so they used to look at viruses mainly coming in from insects all around the world. And then they learned that you could actually you know, apply these just like chemicals. Um, so that was basically, I went into a group that was developed for, to doing that with the plan I would take over from the guy, Ben Pemblesall, who ran it at that time. And eventually I sort of became a section leader of, of multiple units that dealt with various aspects of pest management or biocontrol or, or other areas. Okay, yeah, and so, I mean, like you mentioned, so after that, you then go to Algoma University in Sault Ste. Marie. Yes. You're there for about three years. In some ways, that, but that was where things started. So yeah. the well-known spot, yes, Northern Ontario is a long way out the way, and I, but I still came to Vancouver to do field work. So I spent a year on sabbatical at UBC as well before I left. Ah, okay. Uh, so I worked with Judy Myers there, who I'd met many years earlier. Um, okay. And then we developed a collaboration. So even from Sault Ste. Marie, it gave me a base to carry on with the long-term studies that we were doing on tent caterpillars and viruses there. And now, and, and now you're at, I mean, you've been at Simon Fraser University since 2008. Yeah. Uh, and you're, so full professor there, Thelma Finlayson Chair in Biological Control, and the director of the Master's in Pest Management Program, which... I think that program is really neat. So that's what I did my master's in. Yeah. I think it's a great program. It's morphed from various 
you know, over the years, as you know, from something that was more professional degree to something that's more of a standard research master's now with more of an applied um, course content, a slightly higher course content than the average master's student. Did you have any uh, researchers or people that were your main inspirations? Well, I think as an undergraduate, there's um, a chap called Tim Burkhead, but he was, he was a bird behavioral ecologist, but he also taught the ecology class. So he's the person that first got me really interested in ecology. Um, after that, I mean, I met various people in Oxford. I had a, um, my, my first boss in the job in the, the Institute was someone called Philip Entwistle, and he was a, an interesting character, um, but very, he was very knowledgeable, had great insight in, in pathogen ecology. Um, and I felt I learned a lot from him in terms of how one could maybe take a more ecological approach to uh, microbial pest control. Um, and as I mentioned, I spent a year with Judy Myers over at UBC and Judy has also been a, um, a good supporter of me and mentor. And I've, I found interacting with her has been really very helpful and, and fun as well. We're still yeah. friends, we still work together. What would you say are some of the most important skills or values you think that have helped guide your career? I think for me, they're more personal values um, rather than things I picked up from other people. I mean, I think the first one is to is the honesty one and really just trying to find the truth, um, the underpinning truth in science. And I did some work that was involved with genetically modified organisms, which was a, a challenging time. And then there was a lot of pressure, maybe at that point, to um, do things or say things that were convenient at the time. And I, I felt that was a time when I really learned academically. I was happy to support any decision I made, but not decisions other people made for me. So, mm. I mean, so for me, it's always been very, very honest and, and sticking to your guns about what you believe. Yeah. Uh, and and there was also that went for research. There's several times I've said, okay, I think this is worth looking at. And people said to me, no, I don't believe it happens. And I've gone through with it and you know, I've been right and it has been interesting. So I think, again, just stick to your gut feeling and um, you know, be honest about it. I don't know, that would yeah. be my own feeling for my own personal drive. I mean, it's, it's uh, pretty interesting because I feel like, um, you know, a lot of scientists are usually, that is at least one of their drives is just this pursuit of truth. And it's unfortunate when there is this, it seems like a big gap, you know, between the general public and academia or scientists in general, mm -hmm. where the general public, you know, in many ways think scientists are out to make up stuff or to control people or to... I don't know, provide uh, information that is not necessarily true or slightly fabricated or whatever it might be. And uh, it's just kind of, I think, unfortunate on our side, knowing the people in our field that are doing everything we can to, you know, just investigate our, our reality, you know, <laughs> investigate truth. And uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's unfortunate to see that uh, sometimes it can be perceived differently by the general public. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's true. And uh, one thing I learned in, in the, the you know, this, period when I was doing trials of genetic modified viruses, there's, so people are easily swayed by what they read in the press. And obviously we see that much more now with social media and people believing yeah. it. And I used to get people, I mean, it rings bells of what's happening now, accusing us of making the virus from scratch. And, you know, rather than saying that these are naturally occurring, they only infect one or two species. In the end, I, I learned to put out a sort of a, a five or six page uh, information sheet for people. And people would write back and say, oh, I didn't realize that. That's very really interesting. Thank you. But I think the danger is this sort of um, talking down to people uh, and also assuming maybe a greater knowledge than they actually have, particularly about things like microorganisms. Um, yeah. So I think it's taking the time and the patience to explain things and trying to understand where people come from. And I think the things that are more controversial, like genetic modified organisms, another thing I learned was that people like things they can be in control of. So they don't mind driving or smoking, which might be inherently more dangerous. They don't like the idea that someone else is controlling their life and releasing GMOs into the environment. And that was hmm. kind of interesting. I did a couple of sort of open house um, discussions about this and it was very interesting sort of questions we got from the general public about what we were doing and where their fears came from and a lot of it was to do with lack of control as well as lack of understanding. I'm sure you've been very interested uh, with kind of this whole global pandemic kind of going on because it involves a virus. Why did you ever even choose to focus on viruses and pathogens? Well partly it's because that was my job so I went into it knowing nothing. I went from predators to pathogens um, and I had, it was a very, very steep learning curve. So not only wow. learning about the group, but also learning a whole lot of molecular techniques, which are required to look at them. 
Yeah. And I think I just thought this was an area where people knew, in terms of ecology, we knew a lot about predators, we knew a lot about parasitoids, but we knew very little about what pathogens were doing in the natural environment. So mm. I really felt this was a, a great area to really learn what was happening. They were the understudied group, and I really wanted to understand whether pathogens played a role in populations, but also in communities. Um, so a lot of my work is underpinned by sort of basic ecological questions, and then you can apply that to saying, okay, can we use these beneficially? Hence the biocontrol side of them. But it was really a passion for trying to understand what on earth pathogens were doing out there, because obviously they're difficult to see, so they've been overlooked. And I think we're learning, and as we are now with the microbiome, that a lot of the things we can't see are actually probably playing a big role in ecology. Yeah, microbiome has become, I feel like in the last five years, something that like a whole field has kind of exploded. Yes. Or, or maybe um, longer. I don't know. At least, in, <laughs> at least from what I've seen. <laughs> yeah, no, I would agree. And that's something we're yeah. getting into now. I mean, does yeah. the microbiome in, you know, influence the insect? And does that influence the pathogens? And obviously there's these uh, well-known examples about symbionts that maybe do interfere with pathogens. But as a general rule, we really don't know what's going on in most groups of insects. Yeah. And, and when we're talking microbiomes, that's the, the community of bacteria and the relative concentrations of them within another organism. And yes. that can affect their potentially the physiology or their behaviors and things like that. Yeah, well, everything from being very specifically related to a particular pathogen coming in, like say well back here, to things that are just eating, I don't know, bacteria off a leaf surface that's going to affect feeding rate, that might affect immunity, that might have a knock-on effect on growth and susceptibility. Okay, so now going back to virus, um, viruses and, and kind of seeing if it relates at all to the pandemic, you know, you have a number of people that will argue, um, that, you know, the, the one, one effective way, and I'm talking to general public here, one effective way to, of fighting viruses if we just all get the virus and become immune. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is there any evidence in insect viruses where that might not hold true? Is that, you know, is that, is that a possible solution based on what we know from insect viruses? Insect viruses don't have an immune memory. That, that doesn't, that's the one big difference between the vertebrate and the invertebrate immune system. You can still get, I'd imagine, selection pressure towards resistant insects towards a certain virus, or has that not happened? Well, yeah, no, certainly you can select for resistance very strongly, and I think that the case where it's been demonstrated most clearly is in virus control of the codling moth. Okay. It's a virus, particularly in Europe, and that's developed resistance up to 100,000 fold. To the virus. Wow. So that's the most impressive, and that's be partly because the commercial product is um, very narrow genetically. So it's like one strain. So I think it also points to the fact that genetic diversity is going to be important. I, I think, you know, um, this, this paper that I want to discuss with our group, you know, it's titled Trade-Offs and Mixed Infections in an Obligate Killing Insect Pathogen. Um, it's basically discussing and exploring the theory that there are trade-offs between pathogen fitness traits, mm -hmm. uh, namely virulence and uh, transmission. Viruses that y'all are studying are nucleopolyhedroviruses, which yeah. need to be consumed, needs to be eaten. Need to be eaten. They only infect the larvae. larvae. Um, they produce millions and millions of virus particles when they die, and they occur naturally. So you'd expect any high-density population to eventually die of the virus, um, but maybe it doesn't ha happen quick enough for pest management. Okay. And this virus uh, can evolve and how quickly do you see, see that kind of potentially occur? Evolution could potentially happen very quickly in these viruses. And that's partly, although the DNA viruses and DNA viruses don't evolve as quickly as RNA viruses, one of the main issues is they have this sort of weird structure. So they're like a little cluster bomb. So each virus unit that the insect eats is made up of lots of DNA cores, so lots of variants. So once they get in the insect, they have the potential to recombine very quickly. Oh, wow. The potential for adaptation is quite high. So for example, we've done studies of other insects and just sort of dilution cloning out what was in there, we found 24 distinct variants from one caterpillar. Wow. So that's kind of the sort of background information that, that paper, the, the uh, army one paper was built on. You know, so we, we knew there'd be variation in the virus naturally. Okay. Wow. And that's, you know, thinking now about, uh, you know, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, from what I've read, I, I understand it's, a, it's an RNA virus, and mm -hmm. there's preliminary findings that it, there might be two strains, you know, and so yeah. just kind of trying to relate a little bit. And you said DNA viruses, typically, uh, they evolve slower than RNA viruses? Yes. Yeah. Um, RNA viruses, are often they, they cause what they might call species swarms. So essentially, 
they mutate so rapidly within the host. So within vertebrate host, you've got a virus mutating. So there are websites where they see, they're sequencing all the novel SARS viruses, and you can actually see each novel isolate on them. And I can't remember what it's called, but there's a very cool site where you can actually plot the evolution of all the strains. And it looks to me like it, there's not a clear strain structure, but there's certainly more than two variants out there. There's dozens. Okay. Oh, wow. Well, um, they're phenotypically different. So the genetic differences, whether they translate into phenotypic differences, that's the big question. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, and when we're talking phenotypic, it's essentially how that might express symptoms or, you know, whether, you know, being affected with one would make you resistant to another, right? So we're talking about how it actually yeah. Uh, yeah. physically manifests itself exactly yeah whether it yeah. is equally transmissible whether it takes the same time to kill or infect or again so y'all were looking at this uh this theory exploring this theory where uh there's a trade-off between virulence and transmission why can't a virus be great at both in this the underlying theory here is that if a virus kills some host too quickly so you think think like ebola then and it the, we assume that the infection is going to be severe if it does that. So it's going to be debilitating. So let's say you've got a disease that's bad, it replicates rapidly, you're going to be sick, you're going to lie down. It means your chances of transmission are much lower because you're not moving around and coughing over people. So that's the, one of the underlying theories, and it's probably the, the most favoured one, is you can't do both. You can't go around and infect people while still being transmissible at certain levels. So. So this is why this particular virus is quite neat. Unlike the previous SARS virus, which was in some ways was more pathogenic, but it, it infected very quickly. The host was um, laid low very quickly, so it didn't have much chance to transmit. This one's more sneaky. Yeah. You, you can be asymptomatic for a while. It takes a while for the symptoms to come through. And all that time, people are, are spreading the disease. So that's why the two don't go together. You can either be highly virulent, but not very transmissible, or vice versa is the idea. That's yeah. the theory anyway. Right. And so that'd be the next question. And the, the way that you're inflecting your speech, uh, I'd like to ask, I mean, is that strongly supported or is there a lot of evidence contrary to that? Well, the, the theory is more developed for things that are transmitted while the host is still alive. So like vector-borne diseases. Um, whereas for the viruses that we're talking about, back of the viruses, they're only transmitted when the host dies. So in some ways, that basic theory doesn't hold, although there are versions of it that do. That doesn't make sense. For example, if a host dies quickly, it doesn't produce many transmission stages. Okay. If it takes a long time to kill the host, the host can get a big fat caterpillar, and then it produces lots of transmission stages, so transmission goes up. So that's kind of a version of the transmission virulence trade-off for viruses that what they, what they call obligate killers. Okay. And we call them obligate killers because it's, it has to kill, it kills, it ends up killing the host. Yeah. And it needs to kill the host to transmit. Anytime we try and use something just as a simple a chemical insecticide, even with like BT, I mean, we still get resistance, you know, even though we tell us, you know, we, the thought was, oh, if it's a bio insecticide or it's, you know, biological, you won't get as much resistance or yeah. whatever, but <laughs> it's totally that's not true. That's yeah. one of the big things. I mean, I think people apply them and they also assume they can all be applied together. And that's one of the areas I'm interested in now is can you really apply? Because obviously they can compete for the host. So should we be applying fungi and BT and viruses all together? Yeah. And so that's, I've got students looking at the fungi and the, um, the virus side of things at the moment, but they're fiddly. Mixed infections are tricky. So the idea is also there's multiple species or strains. They should be more virulent because they're competing. But yeah. then what, what ends up, I mean, are, the, are there any preliminary findings or general census yeah. of what kind of happens? With the, with the back of the viruses, the wild type virus is always more virulent. And in this case, I mean the capacity to cause death than yeah. any individual strain. Okay. There's some weird sort of synergism going on amongst strains. And it's more complicated than that. There's also like parasitic strains in there, but we won't worry about that today. What is a parasitic, what is a parasitic strain? Well, um, it's something I, I mean, they're hard to look at. So there are, there are also viruses in there that maybe have incomplete genomes. So for example, they, they don't, they don't, the viruses are kept within a protein coat and some of them yeah. don't have the gene for that protein coat or they don't have another gene for getting into the host because the less genetic baggage you have, the quicker you can replicate. Okay. So yeah. You hitchhike on something that has a full genome, you can still get transmitted. Wow. You maybe can replicate faster. So there's this trade off between within host growth and between host transmission. You can be really good at growing in the host, 
that can be transmitted to the next host. So there's lots of cool things you could ask about it. Wow. Parasitic viruses. That's uh, so that's a whole new thing that I just yeah, learned. It's probably not, not the, the phrase I should use, but it's like this, the idea of short-sighted evolution. Something can be great at infecting a host, but if you can't get out of it to your next host, you're not going anywhere. I mean, it's only going to be as good as the virus that it's uh, piggybacking on yes. in terms of transmitting, yeah. right? I think lots of plant viruses work a bit like that. You know, some of them need, that's why they need the vector. Well, always a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Take yeah. care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. -bye.